we do not get Zoom bombed. What we'll do is we'll close the meeting, restart it, join with the same link. Uh, hopefully the Zoom bombers didn't just hear that right now. Okay, and with that said, I would like to introduce our wonderful, wonderful panel. Uh, they will turn on their videos and say hello as they introduce them. Uh, first up, Claire Friedman is a TV writer living in New York City who's written for Saturday Night Live, uh, Deuce Zamero, and The New Yorker. So please welcome Claire Friedman, everybody. Hey guys, good to see you all, or see your names in square and black boxes. <laughs> uh, then we have uh, Sophie Zucker, who acts and writes on Apple TV Plus's uh, Dickinson and is a part of the comedy group Ladies Who Ranch. Please welcome Sophie Zucker. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Uh, then we have uh, Charlie Barday, who is a writer and comedian based in Brooklyn. Please welcome Charlie Barday. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Um, and uh, we have uh, Sachi Ezra, who is, a who is a comedy development executive and producer. She's worked for MTV, IFC, and currently works at New York Public Radio. Please welcome Sachi Ezra. Hi, how are you? All right, that's one heck of a star-studded panel that we have here. Um, and so uh, I'm going to get right to it and uh, ask everybody to tell us a little bit about how their, uh, how their comedy and how their career has changed over the course of the last year. Cool. I can go first. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think when things were shutting down in March, I remember the weekly open mic that uh, I used to host was like one of the first mics in Brooklyn to cancel. We were sort of like the the sign that the apocalypse was coming. I think we tipped everybody else off. Like once we canceled, then everybody else canceled their mic, and then everybody canceled their shows. And then and we still haven't gone back. And so I think obviously um, live performance mics and auditioning to a certain extent, which happens a lot in person, really. Uh, shut down or slowed down immensely um and as a result i the group that i perform with live ladies who ranch we sort of had to pivot to doing a lot more online stuff which was not um our usual bag uh but it was i think it was like a good exercise and we ended up finding a lot more um uh, yeah, just like a lot more material, I think, than we maybe normally would have found just doing our regular variety show and, um, meeting with them every week on zoom was almost like seeing them every week for <laughs> a mic. Um, so yeah, I was, I was happy for that opportunity, but obviously super, super bummed that I couldn't get to perform live. And then professionally, I was lucky enough that, um, my writing jobs still happened, but it happened all over Zoom, which was uh, definitely a different, much different experience. I think like in a writer's room, you're sort of constantly bouncing ideas off of each other. And um, you're, it's, it's just like easier to be collaborative when you're in the same space. And on Zoom, you know, people were cutting each other off, people felt less comfortable laughing, I think, because they didn't want to interrupt somebody. So it wasn't, it, I think, yeah, it definitely was, was not the same. Yeah. Um, and uh, Sachi, what about you? Um, so I was working in New York Public Radio um, producing live events and obviously live events have changed a lot. So that has been a major shift. Um, we also had to like shift all of our shows to Zoom, um, which has been uh, an experiment. And uh, the main way that my life has changed um, because of the pandemic is that I moved to New Jersey, which I never, ever thought I would do as a lifelong New Yorker and Hunter. I, but I love it. <laughs> uh, what about you, Charlie? Um, yeah, I mean, pretty similar to Sophie. I, it was sort of interesting just because like my main comedic outlet was live performance and it pretty much evaporated overnight. Um, which obviously was hard and I, I miss it very much. But on the other hand, I mean, I'd for like years been sort of like very slowly in the time I had been working to develop some like longer term projects. So trying to finish some scripts um, 
And, you know, that that's pretty hard to do or to find time for when you work during the day and then like four or five nights a week, you're out at shows. So it, it was actually kind of a nice opportunity to like develop um, some new sort of like writing structures. And, you know, after, especially after the first month, well, I also, I had COVID in March. <laughs> um, and so spent a month like really not doing that much. Um, but then after that was able to actually like, you know, learn how to edit videos, which I told myself I should do for a year. And, you know, I finished two pilots. So it was nice to be able to finally work on some kind of longer stuff. Um, it's good that you were actually productive because there are millions of people who said they were going to paint a room this year and still haven't bought. Them yet, so. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they're Stop definitely two pilots. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I guess um, I really tried to do the like, I'm just going to chill hardcore. And I guess I did. I I said I would do a lot more than I did. So I don't want to be I don't want to isolate anyone by being like, it's, oh, it's I'm still... amazing, whatever. I'm human. I'm just like everybody else. But yeah, we don't know if the pilots are any good yet. You yeah, know, exactly. And you know what? We're yeah. still sort of in the active editing process. And that's <laughs> sort of a live question <laughs> for me as well. All right. What about you, Claire? Um, like Sophie, when the pandemic started, I was working for a late night show and we left the studio and started doing everything over Zoom. We were actually also supposed to host uh, a Hunter stand-up comedy night with many of the people on this call, uh, but we ended up having to postpone that till May of 2020 and then indefinitely. And then I guess this is sort of the stand-in for that event. So it's finally happening. Um, then I had a baby in May, so very productive, but I also sort of stopped doing a lot of writing at that point. And um, I guess one of the main changes other than having a baby and not and getting a lot of great material, but not having a lot of time to write is that I've been able to do more, you know, written comedy for humor magazines and the New Yorker and things that don't involve being in person that you can just do at home alone. And so I've sort of, um, done a bit more of that. Some of it has been about COVID and some of it has not been about COVID. So the material has changed a little too. Excellent. Um, well, we, we gotten a whole bunch of questions submitted ahead of time. And so we're going to take a few of those first, and then we are going to turn it over to our live audience uh, to ask questions as well. Um, so first, we'll show you how questions work. OK. Um, <laughs> So the first question, and this is something I have very strong opinions on, and I assume that the rest of the panel does as well. Um, how can a young comic fearlessly express their voice in today's political correct ethos where quote unquote canceling is now mainstream? Um, so uh, who, who on our panel would like to start with this one? Um, I'll start. <laughs> OK. Um, I'm fascinated by this question because it just seems so um, Stunning to me that a, a Hunterite would ask this. I was like trying to imagine the person who is like very afraid of being canceled and also went to Hunter where like creative expression was so valued. They let us put a hookup web in our yearbook and um, people said all kinds of crazy shit on stage. And uh, are we allowed to curse? It's too late. I cursed. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think cancel culture is a real thing. I don't think that anybody is being canceled in a way that has affected their career in for anything other than like really loudly saying racial slurs or sexually assaulting people. Um, so I'm I I know this is a huge part of the discourse right now, and everyone's terrified that like Dr. Seuss is getting canceled, but um, he's not. People are going to read his book for the next centuries. And the things that people think of as cancel culture right now are, um, I, I don't know, it's it's mind blowing to me because it's it's truly just the voices of people who have never been able to express themselves before finally getting to go on Twitter and go like, hey, that's racist or that's sexist. And then sometimes people lose like minute job opportunities from that and then they come back swinging and still get to perform for hundreds of thousands of people so um that's my incredibly opinionated take on that question well hey those six dr seuss books that no one ever heard of before are gone now you know so what are people gonna do <laughs> I, I actually own them used copies i do own own some of those books um because yeah. i did get a uh a full anthology of all of the dr seuss books as a present when i had a baby and um 
they they're racist. <laughs> I mean, they have like yeah. pictures of little Chinamen in them. So um, I I think it's cool that I have them as like a, an artifact, but they're certainly not the ones I'm going to be yeah. most excited to share with my child. Um, anyone else? Yeah, I think um, Anthony Jeselnik, who is this great comic, great season comic, um, sort of like traditional white male standup, has a great answer to this where he says something like asking a comic how they feel about political correctness is like asking a football player how they feel about the football in that it's like an intrinsic part of the game because comedy has always been about finding a way to express yourself that lands with your audience. So it's like those constraints are what give us careers. If I wasn't trying to find a humorous way to say it in a way that didn't offend my audience, then I wouldn't be a comic. I would just be having a conversation or screaming on a stage or something. And so I think that, you know, the the guidelines, they evolve and they'll continue to evolve. And I'm like very thankful for them. Um, I personally like don't don't enjoy making comedy that's, you know, racist or sexist. But, you know, if you sort of like what Satya was saying, like <laughs> if that is something you want to do, like you can find your audience and you probably won't be canceled. You'll probably, you know, still make a lot of money doing it. Maybe not in New York, maybe not in LA, but somewhere. Well, what I'm curious about is I don't, I can't name anyone who's been canceled. Like despite cancel culture being this huge specter hanging over all of us, I can't name a single person who's been canceled. I can name people who have been thrown in jail for crimes. Uh, and I can name people who have stopped being hired because of it. Cosby's not touring right now. But <laughs> people who actually, I can name people who lost work and then who got other work. And that's what happens. That's called being fired, not being canceled. And I've been fired from jobs for much less. So I think a lot of people have been fired. And thankfully, some people have been arrested. But I cannot name a single comedian who has been canceled. Can any of you? No. Yeah. I, I always find it funny. Like, um, uh, I feel like I started hearing a lot about cancel culture in comedy when I would be at like shows or mics and people would tell jokes that didn't do well and they would kind of bomb and they'd be like, oh, okay, everybody here is cancel culture everybody here is too woke for me sorry and it's like no dude your joke is just bad like yeah. that's not it you're actually and so it's an interesting way that this becomes like you know a sort of device for people to like you know hide the fact that it's like word your comedy just isn't actually connecting with an audience which by the way is your job yeah like this is you have to be like making comedy for the world we're in and you know it's constraint like that kind of constraint is like what the whole sort of process is yeah and you know you hear people who will say things like oh well if george carlin were around today he'd have been canceled if richard pryor were around today he'd have been canceled and it's like no they would have understood the human condition still and they would have been able to write for the time so sure, or maybe they would have been i mean people are like oh well you know john lennon and picasso like assaulted women and and that's you know possible and that means that we should take their art in in a way in which like let's consider the artist and the art separately perhaps and but also like now we live in a society where it's less acceptable to beat women and that allows for more women to become artists and for women to live lives without being beaten and i'll take that trade off like i'll take the trade off of we now get to see the work of the women who didn't get to become successful because we were all so excited about Picasso and John Lennon. Yeah, well said. Um, so here's another question. Um, and as someone who is in Hunter Improv, this is fun uh, to see what your reactions are. And I'm curious uh, what, what your uh, high school theater experiences were. But one of the questions is, can anyone do improv? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not anyone will be good at it, but no. <laughs> uh, yeah, 100%. I think there's like 
I think there's sort of a myth when it comes to like being funny and specifically something about improvisation where it's like either you have it or you don't. And it's it, comedy and like improv comedy is a muscle like anything else, you know, the raw talent aspect of it is so small. You just have to like practice and work at it. And it's really fun. And there are too many improv theaters. So for sure, anyone can do it. You can actually take classes online during the pandemic and do Zoom improv with people. <laughs> Anyone else have any other opinions on that? Or everybody is in agreement? I, I, will, I will say that I will push back a little bit on the idea that I think there are plenty of people who can't do it well, no matter what, no matter how well they're trained, because there is an, there is an innate ability in it the same way that like, if someone is under five feet, they're not gonna be able to dunk there are just certain limitations that I think some people have, but then they'll be better at other aspects of comedy. Potentially, they might be better at sketch. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of people don't realize that stand up, sketch, improv, acting these are all very very different muscles, and there are plenty of people who are really good at one that aren't good at another. Um, okay, we'll move on to the next question. Um, how did your experiences at Hunter inform your comedic sensibility? Um, I, I just feel like personally, I was friends at Hunter with like the funniest people in the world. Like truly, it's just like my, my, I, and still, honestly, like the funniest people I've ever met are my friends from Hunter. Um, and there was just sort of in the same way that Hunter is like competitive about a lot of things. I think there was a, a competition to be like, who can be the craziest and funniest and, you know, kind of most outrageous, um, and then beyond that, there actually was sort of an institutional, like, I mean, the theater program was just so robust and it was so encouraged. Um, like it was just, it was, you could be in a place where you were, your skills could actually be developed. I mean, I know for me, Miss Sturiano, Meg Sturiano was like hugely formative in what I do today. And I received like an actual theatrical training that informs so much of my work, right? And just and sort of inspires me to approach everything I do with like rigor and um, and like joy, I guess. Maybe it's just me, but I, or maybe it's my memory, but I remember Hunter being um, a very serious place. <laughs> I mean, my friends were witty and funny and we would joke around, but I feel like, and again, maybe this was just me, I took uh, it very seriously being there and I don't remember a ton of humor in any of the classes or any of the extracurriculars. I actually did stand-up comedy um, outside of school when I was in high school and I felt always when I was doing that like I was a totally different person than I was when I was in school very seriously trying to you know study for a social studies test or um, I like never felt like a class clown. I was so concerned about, you know, learning the material and getting good grades and all that stuff that I feel like so many Hunter kids are very pre like uh, focused on. So when I try to think about Hunter, my Hunter experience, I don't remember that much laughter, to be honest. You didn't find AP prep hilarious? <laughs> I did not, though actually I saw Eli Adler and, uh, is also on the Zoom and I do remember once we were in a group project together and he taught me about Jack Handy and taught me all of Jack Handy's quotes. And that was very funny, but that's like one of the only memories I have of any humor uh, going into any experience that I had in high school, so. I think that there was like an honesty to the way that we talked to each other and a like meanness sometimes that made me funnier when I got to college, everybody was so nice. And I asked my mom, like, why is everyone so fake here? And she was like, that's just what people are like outside of New York City. Like people are, <laughs> that's not them being fake. That's just like, you're used to this kind of like witty barbs, like sarcastic voice that, that all your friends talk in. So, but I, I do think that that taught me to be funnier and also like, the the intensity around school stuff was definitely like we worked hard and played hard and 
like I laughed very, I mean, my best friends still are my hunter friends. Yeah, I agree. I think there was like a lot of roasting that went on between friends. And I think you sort of had to learn to like take it in stride and sort of learn to laugh at yourself. And that has certainly informed a lot of the comedy that I do, which is like a lot of character based stuff and finding like my worst flaw and being like, yes, I, you know, I'm, I'm a bitch and I love being a bitch and sort of building a character out from there. And then the other thing I'll say is that um, Charlie and I used to do brick together, the um, student written play festival. And we would uh, spend <laughs> the last <laughs> night um, changing the words on everyone's like brick poster to say uh, like, if I don't know if it said like brick put, prison playhouse or something we would somehow change it to say like happy 30th birthday rick and we thought it was <laughs> so funny and yeah. it was like it was like the first example of like a bit that i was like this is yeah. just stupid and funny and i am cr crying laughing I, I remember one night at like a cast sleepover the two of us staying up until truly 5 a.m just completely talking like oh, oh we were doing a like a take on like clap if you've done this thing oh, yeah. Yeah, and we yeah. were doing it like until 5 a.m. <laughs> but I think that the kind of ethos was like we were also like underslept and just like pushed to such extreme sometimes that it really could make you just go kind of insane in this way that for me was really fertile to being like to finding humor. I mean, there was like people had their own language, like like people, yeah. Charlie and his friends and, and, and my friends used to say Dwatsi, which oh, was... <laughs> short for don't worry about that shit yo and it was just, <laughs> but that was like then everyone in school was saying dwatsi like it yeah. was just that kind of i don't know yeah, joke a, a pleasure in like wordplay and language that like was pretty widely shared it felt yeah I, yeah I, I think like one um like something i said at some point was that martin shkreli and lynn manuel miranda both went to hunter which is like shows you that what they taught you was like, you can do absolutely anything you want as long as you're really good at it. Like just <laughs> give the freedom to experiment and do all kinds of crazy things, but like you better just be the best person at it. Even if it's like, you know, being an evil pharmaceutical person. It also shows us that our theater program is great, but we need an ethics curriculum. <laughs> um, the, I, I actually found, uh, you know, when I started Hunter, I found a great deal of bullying and I think part of that is the competitive environment that we were in, but I found the theater program as a way out of that, and I found improv as a way out of that. Um, and I, w I actually moved recently, and I found some of my old stuff, including a program from Brick Prison, where I was in it at the same time as Lynn and Chris Hayes and Immortal Technique. And it's wow. kind of crazy that we're just on that same page together as children. Yeah. So, and that's what Hunter was. Um, all right, some more uh, some more questions before we go uh, before we go live. And also, by the way, shout out to the free callway for you know <laughs> that that was very important during my time there. Um, okay, Did Sophie and Charlie, you guys that still existed when you were there. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of people who did tech for the shows. Uh -huh, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. yeah. And did they play Magic the Gathering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but a lot of ple people play magic also. <laughs> With mainstream by then, I think. <laughs> uh, may the free callway live forever. Um, all right. So, um, what is the what is the best grist for the mill these days when it comes to comedy? You know, no one, one has one... an answer for that. <laughs> I think one sort of, and maybe this is particular, but one thing that's been nice about being kind of isolated um, has been like kind of getting to spend a little bit more time inside my mind. And rather than like, you know, writing tweets about like the subway or things that are a little bit more sort of universal, I can write tweets about things that feel really particular or things that I'm just thinking about. Um, and I'm, I'm a math tutor as like my day job. So I've found that it's, I've written a lot of um, comedy in the past few months about like the math that I'm doing and what I find funny and interesting about it. And a lot of stuff that I would never sort of, in a different context, in a different world, I would like not assume that this is interesting, but now like 
nine months in, I'm like, well, nobody else has anything new to think about. So I might as well just share like stuff about the law of cosines and the change of base rule. And so that's been kind of nice. And fields informed by Hunter as well. <laughs> Anybody else? I don't really understand this question. Um, what What's inspiring you for material these days? <laughs> oh, nothing. Um, <laughs> uh, no, my, my friends seeing like always just, yeah, seeing, seeing them make stuff and, and working on stuff with them. And I don't know, co not really COVID I'll be honest. Um, I'm too, cause I don't want to watch stuff about COVID. So I'm like, I don't want to make stuff. About it. Some of the best advice I ever got when it came to writing was, uh, the point of writing is writing something that hasn't been written before. And so if you, you know, if any, if anybody, if whoever asked that is, a, you know, is in comedy or is aspiring or anyone else that's watching is, um, you know, the trick is to find material that other people aren't doing. So um, there are a lot, I see comics all the time. I used to run some clubs and I would see comics audition all the time with an act that anybody could do. And those aren't the comics that we ever booked. The idea is to book the people who, if someone else tried to do their act, it wouldn't work. Yeah, I would say um, motherhood has been very, um, it has led to a lot of material and has made me more inspired to write, which is um, like a relief because I think when you think about starting a family, it definitely feels, especially as a woman, like it could be the end of your career in a lot of ways, or it could be a detriment to your career. Um, so it's been nice that it has um, felt like such a, wild and insane experience that that has led to material. I agree. Um, I've been writing a bit about motherhood, thinking about mothering during the pandemic a little. So I guess that does incorporate um, the times in which we live. But at the same time, it's not it's a somewhat unique experience. Not a lot of people became parents for the first time during the pandemic. But also to be honest, I do feel like since I'm not really living that much or doing that much or seeing people or traveling, it is hard to come up with new material. And I have found myself going into, you know, folders on my computer of things I'd started in the past or pilots I had sort of started working on and stopped working on and sort of revisiting a lot of stuff, like using this time to revisit things that I had begun but hadn't ever um finished because I am struggling to come up with ideas uh, in this time where I stay in my tiny apartment and sort of do nothing. So um. that that actually touches on something that I've seen from young comics, especially in New York, where, you know, there and this pre COVID, but the idea of, oh, I went to 30 open mics this week. And I'm like, OK, cool. When did you live? Because you can't write unless you've lived, unless you're writing an entire set on how garbage open mics can be. Like you need to actually live and experience, take a night off, go have dinner with friends, do something so that you find something to write about. I, I feel like I've, um, I looked back recently at my Twitter um, and I, I realized I've been writing a lot about my kitchen. I have a lot of jokes about like sort of what colander I like and what colander I don't like, you know, when I'm reading a recipe, how the recipe sometimes doesn't restate how much of the, the thing you need, it only puts it in the ingredients. Um, so it's really just kind of narrowing in on the like three novel sources of stimuli um, that I have. It's like Charlie, my kitchen, yeah. And Charlie, you live in Brooklyn? Yeah. And you own two colanders? Yeah, <laughs> very impressive. You're you know, I live well. in I live in <laughs> one of those houses that's been lived in by like 40 people. And like, you know, so I it's just full of years and years of honestly garbage. Um, <laughs> Inherited colanders. Got exactly. It. Yeah, I, I've never bought a colander, but I have maybe six hammers here. If anyone <laughs> needs one, feel free. Those will come in handy when the revolution comes. Exactly. You know, and I'm doing a lot of like I learned how to mount a shelf. It was a big uh, quarantine project. Nice. Again, Where the colander well. is the helmet. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Hammer is the weapon. Perfect. Um, okay, we have a couple more before we are uh, going to our live audience. Um, so, do you consider the people 
that, that they've been cooped up in what you are currently presenting? Like how does, not how does the pandemic inform your comedy, but how does the pandemic inform your relationship with your audience? Yeah, um, well, th this summer I was writing on um, season three of, of Dickinson, which is a show about Emily Dickinson that takes place um, in the 19th century. And the season we were writing about, I hope I'm allowed to say this, I think I am, is uh, it takes place during the Civil War. And um, we were sort of talking about a lot of just basically like looking outside your window and realizing that everything has changed and, you know, pe people, you know, are dying and just like this incredibly bleak, dark time where like society was being restructured. And so we the, the thing about the show is that it's always trying to say relevant things about, you know, our current time period by looking at the past. And so we talked a lot, a lot about what people were feeling during COVID and, and uh, yeah, trying to sort of like meet, meet the moment on the other side and, and ending our season in a way that felt like almost hopeful in a way that we thought maybe people might need. So, yeah. Anyone else? I will say that my, my entire set right now is about gallows humor. And that was what I was writing before COVID, but it absolutely applies to what's happening now. And there's one line in it where I discuss gallows humor and how important it is to survive. And like, there's a little aside that I do that, you know, I'm going to have to find another way to do this once there isn't COVID anymore. But there was, there's a little aside I do where I say, isn't that right? People watching a comedy show at home during a pandemic because just pointing out the idea that the reason that we are doing this is because we understand how important laughter is right now, um, which also fund the arts. Like the idea that people, that the same people who wanna take arts funding away are people who have spent their entire year desperately glued to the arts in order to get them through a difficult time. So hopefully they realize that. Um, anyone else have any comments on this before we move to the next question? I feel like I've, I've just tried to be kind of like a, a trap that was easy for me to fall in, especially at the beginning was like this narrative that like, or just like kind of a universalizing narrative of being like, oh, the thing we're all going through is that we're all bored at home. And I remember sort of chafing at that because I remember people sort of talking like that. And I was like, I had COVID and I was like in pain <laughs> and I was like, I'm not bored. Like, I wish I were bored. I'm like in pain, you know, like, and so I remember just feeling like sort of grating at hearing people talking like for me, but in a way that was like not actually accurate. And I'm sure I do that all the time, but just trying to not be like, oh, since we're all, especially, I mean, it's less true now, but like, oh, since we're all spending time inside our houses, obviously we are all more doing that, but like, you know, being aware that like, right, there are people who are actually going out and doing jobs and it's not just like, oh, I'm on my computer all day, this sucks. If that sort of makes sense. Yeah, one thing, one thing that I learned doing digital comedy this year is realizing how many people are watching it that have nothing to do with COVID. Yeah. Like there are so many people who are watching it because it's more affordable than a night out. Um, you know, they don't have to worry about drinks and food and parking and babysitting. Um, or people watching it because they are in a part of the world that stand-up never comes to, um, or the stand-ups that they watch never come to. Um, there, was a, there was a kid watching on his iPad under his blanket so his parents wouldn't find out in Croatia. And like that's something, one of the amazing things that we've learned from this year is what else technology can do. And even though we were forced to learn that by a terrible, horrible thing, you know, hopefully that there's going to be a lot of silver linings coming out of this once we're all back out there. Um, here's a fun one. Uh, someone asked, did you feel that Hunter equipped you to handle hecklers and critics? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> How so? Let's let's expand on that. Um, well, you mentioned bullies earlier. I feel like I definitely received my share of bullying at Hunter. Um, I think that I probably would have at any high school <laughs> because maybe that's just how high school works. 
but uh, I definitely learned to like be a smart ass back to people. Um, and I, I mean, maybe this was more from therapy than from Hunter, but my therapist was always like, when people are mean to you, just see if you can make the joke about yourself first. And then everybody will be laughing because you're being funny instead of laughing at you for whatever it was they were laughing at you before. And so then I learned, I mean, the thing that I got made fun of all the time for when I was in high school was crying. I cried all the time. And if I just started making the joke before somebody else did that, like, oh my God, what if I started just crying right now? Like, then it was like, it took the power out of their hands and put it in my hands. And and then I realized I could do that about everybody else too and just make the joke about them. And then I became the bully. Um, no, I don't, I hope I wasn't a bully. I was truly just trying to to deal with my own insecurities, but um, yeah, it definitely helped me with hecklers because it just made, it just made me stronger and capable of talking back to people who like were trying to make me feel bad about myself. By the way, did, did you getting made fun of for crying make you cry? Because that's a vicious cycle. Yes, yeah, it did. But then I learned. And now, like, I'll say that to somebody. I'll be like, yeah, because you know how I cry all the time. And they'll be like, I've never seen you cry. And I'll be like, oh, right. That's just a thing that <laughs> people very close to me now see, but not like most of my coworkers. Yeah. Yeah, I think Hunter taught taught me how to deal with critics or even like taught me how to self-critique just because the standard of excellence was, or whatever, there was a standard of excellence in sort of everything you did, academics and theater and whatever. And, you know, I think Hunter taught you that to to be the best at it doesn't mean you have to be perfect at it all the time. If anything, it probably means you had to like self-reflect and edit a lot. Um, and so that's, because this business is, it's a ton of reject. It's so much rejection. It's like 90% rejection. And so you just have to kind of know that like, you're still good. Maybe, maybe Hunter gave me an inflated sense of self by telling us we were so gifted all the time, but <laughs> I could like not get cast in anything for a year and be like, still an actor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Claire or Charlie? Uh... I mean, I think Sophie's point rings true with me too. Um, I feel like I got rejected from a lot of things at Hunter because you're competing with like the best of the best. Like I wanted to direct HTE and I got rejected from that. And I, you know, I, you know, sort of got used to the idea that there were all these other really talented people in the world. Um, so the flip side of being told that you're gifted and talented all the time is that you see all these other gifted and talented people who beat you out for lots of things. And so I feel like I came into college, unlike a lot of other people who came in who always got everything they wanted in high school and were always, always the best, um, realizing that, you know, you're not going to get everything. You're going to get rejected from stuff. Just keep trying, keep going for the things you want. Um, so I feel like for me, in that sense, it was like more resilience. I was trying to remember like what bullying was happening at Hunter, but I think I might have like really done an amazing job of like blocking all of that out of my memory because I know it happened, but I couldn't think of a single example or the impact it had on me. So I think I've very effectively suppressed uh, anything like that that happened to me in high school. I think I just remembered, Claire, did, did you play the little girl when you were in eighth grade in HTE? Yeah, in Brighton Beach memoir. That's, that's the first thing I remember getting rejected from is, so is that I got called back for that. And then I was like, who is this eighth grader who got this part? Oh, that's so funny. That was the only time I ever got cast in anything other than in seventh grade, Lynn Manuel Miranda cast me as um, Girl at Party uh, in Seven Minutes in Heaven, his first musical. I think because I looked so pathetic in the audition that he just like put me in it out of sheer like sadness for me. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I went from a very shy and quiet kid in the beginning to speaking at our graduation, which, you know, was a, a weird and wild transformation for me. And now speaking for a living. Um, and I think, you know, for me, a lot of that was, uh, you know, was the theater program, uh, specifically the improv club. Um, and there was even a moment during that speech where like a baby interrupted me and I had to deal with it. And, you know, you can't get mad at a baby. 
Uh, no, so, you, you can. Well, <laughs> I, I'll tell you now from experience, you can you can definitely get mad at a baby. Uh, and you, you can heckle a baby too. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I just I just turned to the baby and I said thank you. Um, <laughs> but the uh, but but I do think that one of the interesting things about Hunter is that um, there is you know while. I did say, you know, I experienced bullying. I, I do think it was less than a lot of other schools. I do remember an incident where I saw like someone came in wearing a shirt that had like a math joke on it. And I just remember joking with him about like, man, you're lucky you go here and not another school. You could not <laughs> wear that at another school. Um, but here people are like, hey, love your math joke. So it, I, th I think to some extent, but the, there was also that sense of freedom allowed for some kinds of bullying that I don't think would have happened at other schools. Like we had an entire like inside joke that was written on everybody's shirts that was based around like a sexual act that happened between two people that like it was so dumb and like so I don't know. There was this word, honestly, that like our entire grade used to say all the time because it was like based on this experience that this one girl had with this one guy and some stupid story about their sexual act. I don't think that that would have flown at a lot of other schools. And like in retrospect, I think that that was probably really fucked up for that girl. But, um, you know, that there there was bullying that was like and maybe that's normal and that's what happens in high school to people but like it's it's crazy the kinds of things that people just like were like this is silly we're all just being silly yeah i would i would point to the yearbook as another example of that yeah where like people will immortalize bullying in a yearbook yeah. which is weird to do um i remember the uh there were a couple of years where there was the separated at birth feature where you're just basically the whole joke was making fun of how someone looked. Um, and while I do think, you know, going back to that first question about cancel culture, you know, the freedom of expression that Hunter gave was fantastic. But then there were also people who were using being mean as a substitute for being funny. And part of that is because when you're first starting in comedy, you don't know what's funny yet. Um, but also there were adults that sometimes should be like, hey, that's not okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, we are. We have gone through the questions that were submitted ahead of time. Should we do some live ones now? I'll take that as a maybe. Sure. Let's do that. So everyone, if you wanted to come on with your video camera, please feel free to do that. And if you have a question, please let's use the raise hand function so I can easily spot the questions because there are many of us. And thank you so much for coming. Okay, Brent, uh, go ahead. Uh, you need to unmute yourself and yes, go ahead. Hi everybody. Thank you all for sharing your perspective and wisdom. I'm a big comedy fan and I, I've been looking forward to this. So I appreciate hearing your stories and I wanna learn more about your stories. I'm also in the arts, I'm a composer, and I'm like you forging my own path in this creative industry. So could you talk about how you, how you got started? Like how did you get your first major gigs, your breakthrough gigs? How did you kind of you know, work, work to that point where you're like, okay, I've, I'm doing something, I can make a career out of myself just starting off? Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's such a good question. It's really different for everyone. Like there is no blueprint. Um, I sort of heard it described to me once as like, I mean, they were talking about the TV industry, but I'm sure it's the same in music. Like there's basically a wall and then like a crack opens and you can sort of slip through it in your opportunity. And then the wall closes up behind you. And then like no one else is gonna ever slip through in the same way that you did. But basically what, what happened to me is I was just performing as much as I could um, live and because that was what was available to me at the time and getting, you know, whatever, uh, trying to get better at it. And then um, a manager saw me and then it was like a year or two of that and auditioning and working with him before I got my first big role, which was Dickinson, which let me quit my 
very delicate balance of three day jobs. Um, so it's definitely, <laughs> it's hard. I got fired from a lot of day jobs for uh, trying to go on auditions and pursuing my art, but it's kind of just like do, doing everything that you have available to you and, and honestly not giving up because I think if you just stick with it long enough, usually something happens. Yeah, I think also like we're in a time when there are so many different avenues to try to do things and get um, get your your work out there. Like, you know, there I mean, I don't know a lot about the music industry, but within the comedy world, you can make a web series or a podcast or, you know, you can go on Instagram or TikTok or um you know, you can write short pieces for McSweeney's or The New Yorker, or you can like, uh, you know, go the traditional route of stand up or improv or sketch. Um, and so much of it is just about like finding that thing that works well for you. Um, and, uh, you know, figuring out which of those media makes the most sense for you. And then I think working with other people that you really like working with who get your sensibility and like collaborating because those are the people who like, as they then get successful, they will help you. And, you know, you guys will kind of like rise up together through the ranks. Yeah, I only know how to start being a stand-up comedian in 2002. So it's a little different now because the way you do it now is digitally. And, you know, we didn't even have GPS then. Um, but the two things that I did throughout my career that I would recommend no matter when you start or what field you're in is I created my own content so that I never needed to ask permission from an executive or someone else to be able to perform. And two, um, I invested in myself and realizing that, you know, if you have to cut back on your leisure time so you can afford a camera in order to shoot things or um, you know, being able to afford, you know, back in my time it was press kits or, you know, whatever else it is. Um, when I had the clip that went viral that changed my career, it's because I filmed every show for nine years until I had that clip. Um, all right, let's take another question. Hi, um, Sachi, I'm also... Hey. I'm also Hey, Sachi. Hey, everyone. Uh, Sachi, I'm also hanging out in uh, in New Jersey. This is where I, this is where I'm hiding at. So I'm writing out writing out the pandemic. Yay! Yeah, Jersey's great. Um, New York City sucks. Um, That's awesome because Nuri and I grew up on the same street. Yep. So we just and then we went to the same college. We just moved from like place to place. <laughs> now we're in the same state, right next to New York. What are the odds? And your Zoom boxes are next to each other too. <laughs> what? Um, yeah, so, okay. So I have been really missing open mics, which are usually a thing that I do to stay sane. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's not great. Um, but I'm wondering if there's anything really like positive. So I think Steve was starting to get at this. Like, are there any positive things that people are figuring out uh during this pandemic that we we're actually going to be able to uh apply back when like in-person things happen again so i've got the you know the kid in croatia actually getting to watch some comedy um anything else anything that's like only happened because of zoom that's now going to be like good in the future or better in the future I mean, one thing that I have noticed is, I mean, I used to have to fly to LA all the time to take meetings. And now I don't think I'll ever have to do that again, unless it's like to actually shoot something because people have gotten very comfortable with um, doing that sort of general type of meeting over Zoom, um, which, you know, is, um, so I think just in terms of cutting back on travel, it's great for the environment. It saves a lot of time. Um, I think that's probably going to stick around for quite a while. Yeah, I was going to... Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say similarly, um, in, in the writer's room I was in, we had people who didn't live in New York or LA, which are, you know, two super expensive cities to live in. And so I think maybe... Uh, there will be some version of that in future writer's room where you can have, you know, a, a producer who comes in and chats with you occasionally and doesn't have to 
relocate to LA for four months and can afford to stay in their house in Maryland or wherever they were. <laughs> yeah, I, li I live in Pittsburgh now. That's great. Um, I will say the the things that I think are are you know the benefits that are going to stick around. One, um, I tour the world from my home now, which is kind of incredible. Um, one of the things we're producing at at uh, Nowhere, which is my digital comedy club, is uh, Bill Burr is doing a show just for Australia and New Zealand from LA, and that's an incredible change. Um, also, uh, I perform once a week with a friend of mine who I can rarely tour with because he's an Australian comic. And we do a show Monday nights and to, for me and Tuesday morning for him, and we do a show together that we can usually only do that for a week or two a year. And now we do it every single week. And the last thing is you never need to go to an open mic again. Um, you can now put together 10 comics on Zoom, actually do a writer's workshop, actually work on jokes instead of performing to a bar half full of people who are ignoring you. And so you can learn so much more about specific material by turning an open mic into a writer's room instead. And that's something that we didn't have before. I think open mics will come back. Oh, they'll come back for sure. There's the desperation of it all, but the... I but, love open mics. I think that open mic culture has changed. I truly do. I think that there is a like the the old model of like going to the club and paying bringer shows like buying $17 Coors Lights like yeah that sucked but then nowadays there are these open mics that are so much more positive that are like I mean Sophie knows they're the, Sophie the runs like the best like, open mic I love Sophie's open mic it is so ranch, fun it's so fun what's it's it like what's it female <laughs> Ladies who ran. You should come when it comes back. I don't know what space it will be in because all the spaces have gone out of business in New York, but it will happen. Ladies who ranch open that's mic. What, that's what the show is called. All right. Um, the, the show and the mic. Yeah. yeah. And like, and there were spaces that were just like way more collaborative, way more like female and queer centric, um, way more like open to people doing weird characters and sketch and stuff. It it just like they're the the notion of what an open mic could be really changed and i hope that that continues because as much as it's great to like get together with a group and try out some stuff on zoom like when you're first starting out you might know no one and so like it is awesome that in new york and la and some other places there are are these opportunities to go just try some stuff and find your tribe uh next question what do we got Eli, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned support comedy in the arts. I was wondering what's a good way to do that besides showing up to shows and being like supportive on social media and stuff. Hi, Eli. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> I also moved out of the city after reading your article. I moved to uh, <laughs> Westchester. <laughs> That's awesome. By myself in Westchester, yeah, it's pretty sweet. Um, <laughs> Well, I will say there's never been an easier time to support uh, a digital artist. So many of us have Patreons or something to that effect, whether, you know, we're doing digital shows where you could buy tickets or it's just something where, you know, you could do it anywhere from, you know, a dollar a month to I have some patrons who do a hundred dollar a month package. And it's another way to sidestep the, you know, the 65 year old white men in suits telling you what is and isn't comedy. Um, it's a way to, you know, go directly to people. And so I think, um, I mean, do, does anyone on the panel have experience with that sort of thing, with direct support from fans? I don't, but Eli, if you enjoyed what you heard tonight, we'll send you our Venmo handles and you can just go on. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, is, but that is absolutely true. And, you know, I've, I've seen comics get emails from people all the time now saying like, hey, can I send you a couple bucks? you know, I enjoy that video or whatever it is. And it's everything from Facebook stars now, um, you know, Facebook has like a currency um, to Twitch streamers, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's also sharing video as well. Um, you know, TikTok has a creator fund now. So the more you share the stuff that you like, um, you don't even have to financially support someone. You can help them that way as well. Yeah, I think following people on social media, because they'll tell you if you follow their Twitter or their Instagram or whatever, they will 
keep you updated on their projects and they'll tell you where they're going next. One thing that I'm just thinking of because I literally heard it today on the podcast script notes is it's not just supporting current artists, but for example, all the support staff in LA, assistants, et cetera, many, many people who are trying to get jobs as creative execs or as artists, but they're starting at the bottom, which is pretty much what everybody does, have um, many have lost their jobs and have lost a ton of money. So like um, there have been funds, for example, to help people who are trying to earn a living in order to create art in the first place. So I do think that it's not just the people who are out there and supporting and liking their art, but I think there's a whole group of young people who are trying to make careers in entertainment who actually there are like financial support funds set up so you can help people that way too. Should we take one more? You don't have any more questions. I was saying like we have time for one last question if anyone wants to ask a question. Well, I also want to give a shout out. I see Nurse Elaine is here. Uh, who was one of my absolute favorite people at Hunter, and it is wonderful to see her. So I just wanted to say hello. Hi. Oh. You're on. Uh, you're on mute. Hi, everybody. My God, you all grew up. <laughs> <laughs> you all grew up. I got to see you perform one of these days, Stephen. I'm really happy to see you. Thank you very much. As very as much a, as am I to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And while we are at chatting people at also Miss Krilov is here with us. I don't know yes. if she told any Oh my goodness. Oh, Hila. Hi. Hi. So good to see so many of you. I have such fond memories of oops. Yes, just saying. I have such fond memories of all of your theater performances. I wasn't there for all of you, Stephen. I wasn't there with you. I was there with Nurse Elaine, and I miss her too. <laughs> yeah, Nurse Elaine was uh, my audience for a lot of my crying in high school. So, <laughs> so yes, yes. 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 I remember. <laughs> but you're a mommy now. I'm a mommy now. You're a mommy now. Now someone else is crying in my house. How old is she or he? How she's, old? she's 15 months. Oh. What's her name? Eleanor. Claire, what's your son's name? Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Claire, I remember you too. I remember I remember you. It's so wonderful to see you. <laughs> to see everybody and the Adler boys who I, are men. I can't believe it. I'm, Oh my God, everybody. It's crazy. It's crazy. We're all it's so old. <laughs> don't say that. That old. No. <laughs> all right. If you don't have any more questions, then I don't want to hold up our panelists. Thank you so very much for everyone for coming. We yes. really appreciate your time and for everyone for coming. Hope you had a great evening and please come to our, our events. And thank you so much for all the panelists for sharing their experiences there. It was wonderful. It was Thank wonderful. Be before we before we wrap up really quickly, um, uh, the same way, you know, encouraging people to support the arts. Can we go through our panelists and you know, plug anything? Is there anything you want to you wanna tell people to support? Um, you can just follow Ladies Who Ranch on Twitter and Instagram. That'd be cool Ladies. if you're there. Ladies and Ladies Who Ranch. Who ranch? Uh, Charlie, Claire, Sachi. Um, you can follow my Twitter, which is Chunk Barday, like my last name, and Chunk like the word Chunk. Um, I'm, I'm, I spend a lot of time on Twitter, so I'll see you there. You can go like pictures of my baby on Instagram. He's very sensitive about how many likes he gets. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way to get him to stop crying, actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Every time I post a picture, he asks, how many did we get? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, and my uh, my Twitter and Instagram is Mistrionics, like Histrionics, but M-I-S-S, which was my AIM screen name when I was in high school and just <laughs> has carried through till the age of 34. So, um yeah, I, I'll, I'll write the things that I'm doing on there. 
And there's lots of baby pictures. Mm. Excellent. Uh, I have no baby pictures on mine, but sometimes my dog. Uh, just follow me at Steve Hofstetter, and I'm actually about to go do a show with my Australian friend right now uh, yeah. at Nowhere Comedy. So if you want to see any of my digital stuff, you can get tickets off my website, and I am touring again in May. So starting to finally get back out there. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Thanks for organizing. Thank you. Thank you.